I'm glad to, uh, to speak after Kunal because uh, after, um, I mean, all the findings that they have, uh, that he has found through research actually is really confirmed by uh, experience on the field. So I work for the World Bank. Before that, I was with uh, IFC. Uh, I managed for three years the government private sector forum that was uh, mentioned here uh, of trying to bring together the public and the private sector together to discuss public uh, policies. And after that, I supervise basically the portfolio of IFC uh, regarding public-private dialogue, and now I'm with the World Bank Institute where we do exactly the same thing, but using public-private dialogue for uh, good governance rather than only private sector development. The World Bank Group is, um, has helped set up about 60 formal public-private dialogues around the world, and it was uh, very much focused on um, you know, helping uh, government uh, have a pro-private sector um, uh, policy and, and help with uh, private sector development. Uh, more and more now within the World Bank, we're using PPD for very different objectives and private sector development, really for good governance, to demand transparency, uh, to also ask the government to disclose information on, uh, on their contracts with private sector, on, uh, on, the, on the use of, uh, of um, public money. We have done some internal uh, uh, evaluations or independent evaluations about the effectiveness of this public-private dialogue. So over time, uh, from uh, 2005 to uh, uh, last year, we, uh, we really have uh, results that uh, public-private dialogue is effective and, and help uh, business um, uh, grow much faster, much better. In, in the countries. In a <coughs> study of uh, 30 World Bank Group supported public-private dialogue that we did in 2009, we found that uh, the PPDs have sponsored about 400 uh, reforms and helped the private sector save uh, about $500 million over a period of five years. And uh, for a government or for a donor to support PPD, it's very cost-effective because we're investing maybe $100,000 and $200,000 a year in a coordination function within the government or in the private sector or joint secretariat. And, uh, and actually the, 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 the return on investment is uh, very high for every one dollar that you invest, you help the private sector um, uh, save five dollars that they can invest in other activities. Uh, in the context of this conference, I would like to mention one study we did, we commissioned uh, two years ago about how PPD is helping um, uh, countries uh, develop competitive, um, uh, competitive industries in their countries. And these are case studies from the Mediterranean countries. Uh, SBR is really about people. And I, I, I know that it is a very research-oriented and policy-oriented conference. But really, SBR is, uh, is, uh, is uh, you're dealing with people. And the quality of the people are going to make, basically, effective SBR. And, uh, and these are some of the key risks that you are facing when you, when you try to facilitate the discussion between the state and, and, and the private sector, is uh, uh, who are the people sitting at the table? I would disagree with you that you know, it brings only the business elite, because uh, what, when you bring only the business elites, is actually you, are, you may reinforce vested interests, or you may support market distortion. So we need to balance that with uh, you know, with really enlarging and having the more business associations or even having uh, groups that, that, that don't have any representation, like in the informal sector, to come into the, in, into the dialogue. Uh, the, you can also uh, have sustainability issues, especially when it is supported by a donor, whether it's World Bank or GIZ or USAID. Once the donor stops the funding, with the, with the public-private dialogue continue. And it's also about the capacity of the, of the private sector to formulate its policy. Uh, we intervene in, uh, in, uh, in uh, low-income countries, in developing countries, in countries where you have a strong man. So how do you make sure that the private sector is able to understand the problems that they have besides of, you know, the operational issues that they are facing every day? And then, uh, have uh, evidence to support the, 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 the problems that they, are, the, that they want to, to talk with the government. And we have issues of one-man show. You may have a prime minister who is supporting the dialogue, and then you have a new election coming, the prime minister's changed, the new prime minister is not interested in the dialogue. So the, all these uh, questions of sensitivity issues is, uh, 
uh, is uh, so, I mean one of the one of the area that we are facing in, in the programs that we're sponsoring. And uh, of course, you also have um, issues of institutional alignment. I mean, as uh, Kuna says, the question is not to set up a new institution, but how you can build the capacity of the existing institution so that they have the capacity to engage and discuss uh, the policy matters. So to mitigate this risk, what we do is to have a very structured, I mean, we try to have a methodological approach as how we set up and how we advise government in setting up this public-private dialogue. And the first step is really to have a proper diagnostic of the situation and, and trying to identify who are the key stakeholders. Again, we want to avoid having only the business elite to sit with the, with, with the government. And uh, in, in almost... All the countries where in, we intervene, the, the Chamber of Commerce is a corrupt institution. So if you only have the, the Chamber of Commerce who sits and discuss with the government, probably they are going to defend the interests of only a very limited group of, uh, of business owners. And, uh, and this diagnostic will uh, guide us in the design of the public-private dialogue, where issues sit, who should be uh, participating in the dialogue, uh, what are the outputs that we can expect from, uh, from the dialogue. And, uh, and really from the start, we set up uh, an ME framework so that uh, people know what they are trying to achieve with uh, the public-private dialogue and it can, the, the, the actors can track over time how much they have achieved. And the World Bank comes uh, along the way in providing capacity building uh, to, to the actors, both from the private sector and the government in, uh, in, um, in, in the way they interact with each other. So um, I don't know if you want to go into the details, but these are the type of tools that we're looking at. When we set up, a, when we advise the government or the private sector on the setting up of a public-private dialogue, we look at four dimensions. First is, uh, is there a political will from the government? Is the public um, authorities interested in the discussion? Second is, uh, uh, does the private sector have uh, the capacity? I mean, are they organized to discuss with the government? The, the, the third dimension would be, do we have champions? And uh, in, in countries where it's a, it's a bit uh, dictatorial, uh, even the reformers in the government don't want to be seen as reformer because uh, if they are seen as reformer, they are going to be, uh, how you say that, assassinated in, uh, politically, we can put it that way. And then do we have the instruments to make the PPD work? And where, where does the secretary sit? who are going to coordinate that, who are going to even take the minutes. You know, I mean, the capacity is so low in countries where we work that even taking the minutes or organizing a meeting, they don't have the budget, they don't have the people to do it. This is a case of Vietnam. It's uh, probably one of, if not the most successful public-private dialogue that we have in the, in the World Bank uh, group portfolio, where now after 10 years of IFC support, it's a fully sustainable um, organizations with uh, uh, 15 large business associations supporting the Secretariat and being very engaged in, um, in discussing with the government. And uh, when uh, we have about 12 key uh, areas we're looking at, and then in all of these uh, areas you have risk and you have uh, tools to try to mitigate, to mitigate this risk. So we look at the, the mandate of the, of the public-private dialogue. If you set up something informal, especially now that we move into um, civil society organizations and trying, them, trying to get them to discuss with the government, you know, they don't, the people who are sitting there don't have any decision-making process. So how, how do you make sure that uh, the, the, the public-private dialogue is, uh, is, uh, is effective or not? So what's the structure? Who should participate? Who is the facilitator? How is the, org the secretariat organized? Do they have the funding to, to work? Do they have the even you know, IT equipment to, to work? Um, again, outreach and communications to make sure that it's not only the business elite that benefits from the reforms, uh, the monitoring and evaluation. And um, most of the time when we come into a country, we set up a national public-private dialogue, but often what needs to ha I mean, the reforms need to happen at, at provincial level or district level. So how do you make sure that the issues that uh, the businesses are, are, are meeting uh, in, uh, in the provinces are really scaled up to, to the national level? And then relevance to FDI. And do the, has the PPD a role in, uh, in managing or uh, in answering to, to crisis and, uh, and, uh, and helping with post-conflict? 
impact. And then what's the role of development partners like the World Bank? This is a, a component that we have brought into, the, into our work. It's really to uh, get the voice of the citizens and, uh, and, and of informal groups into the public-private dialogue. And uh, we try new tools like um, SMS polling or having people, because I mean, it was very, very much after the Arab Spring, where you see the citizens basically taking up um, you know, the revolution in the country. So when, now how do we get their voice into, into the dialogue with the government. So these are different tools that we um, share with, uh, with the Secretariat to make sure that uh, it ma uh, it's managed properly. Actually, we really think that a, a, an effective SBR works only if you have an effective Secretariat. You have a team that uh, calls meetings, that uh, track the the that track the the progress of the of uh, of the reforms that make sure that uh, that the process is inclusive, unless the secretariat is effective. Basically, we don't think that the SBR can be effective. And uh, we have some tools and techniques. It's not as sophisticated as uh, as <laughs> Doug William and Kuna are doing, but we're tracking basically is the secretariat uh, properly um, organized. And we are tracking if they have an impact on the reform process because it's very difficult to actually make an attribution that because there is a PPD, you have growth. Now, a lot of people from the other part of the World Bank is already attacking us about how do you, you know, how, how dare you claim the result on that while we have all this policy and all these lending programs going on. Uh, so we, we try to make this connection when a reform is directly advocated by the, by the public-private dialogue platform, then we claim for this result. So these are um, evaluation tools that we, uh, that we use to, uh, to measure the effectiveness of the organization here, impact on, on the reform. So these are the type of indicators that we're looking at uh, in terms of uh, outcomes and, uh, and um, impact on, on the economy. First, if there is a regulation or a law that is advocated by the PPD, then if it is enacted or there, there is a change that has happened thanks to the discussion that's taking place, then we take credit for this one. Um, in some, uh, some cases, we also look at economic impact in terms of job creation, in terms of inclusion of uh, disfranchised group in, in the value chain, of women in the value chain. Um, looking at new investment when it is, for example, a, sect, um, a sector focused public private dialogue. Uh, you can really set it up for, I don't know, to improve the competitiveness of uh, the coffee industry in a country. So anything that happens along the, the value chain, basically, we credit it to the, to the public private dialogue. So the new directions that uh, where we are going within the bank is. Uh, uh, we're looking now at, uh, uh, at working with uh, the OECD, which is the Secretariat for the uh, Global Partnership on Aid Effectiveness, you know, as part of the Busan process of elaborating an indicator to measure uh, collaboration between the government and the private sector. Um, again, really increasing citizens' voice in the public-private dialogue. And the, and the third direction that we're looking at is really how can we also use public-private dialogue to uh, uh, demand transparency from the private sector? Because uh, when, when we're talking about public-private dialogue, it's about you know, getting accountability from the government, how to make sure that they disclose information, but actually the private sector has also its share of work to do to be more sustainable and, and, um, and um, yeah, be transparent. I finish my presentation. Oh yeah, last thing, if you are interested in public-private dialogue, there is, a, there is a website where you, we have all the case studies, all the tools, and even a Facebook page. Not yet Twitter, but we come. <laughs>